Ren, your world unfolding. I am Brian Cox. I'm a professor of particle physics at the University of Manchester. And if you want the full title, a Royal Society University Research Fellow. No, I've got that already. The, the, book, the, the new book is Wonders of Life. Wonders of Life. And the book that came out in Penguin is... Uh, That's quantum, a, the quantum universe. The quantum which universe, is, uh, yeah. yeah. Everything... That Everything can that happen. can happen does happen, which is actually a statement of Feynman's approach to quantum mechanics. Okay, which... let me ask you about that very title. Is it true that everything that can happen does happen? Yeah, in a technical sense, what you do, you ask the question, uh, which is all that quantum mechanics tells you, really, is that I have a particle here at one point, and I want to know the probability of it being over here at the next point. What do you do? Well, technically what you do is you add up uh, a quantity. It's called the action, actually, but it doesn't matter what it is. You basically consider the particle moving every possible path from A to B. And Feynman's approach is to do that mathematically. So add up a set of quantities for each possible way, something getting from one place to the other, and you get the probability out in the end that it will actually be in the vicinity of that point at some future time. So it's, it's a statement of sort of technical fact in a way about how you do calculations in quantum theory yes now, but of course the public will immediately infer that everything that can happen in the world does happen well i'm a member i think of this shut up and calculate school of physics where <laughs> well, quantum mechanics works it's the way we design design transistors etc it is our best explanation of everything in the universe other than gravity the, th the problem with the theory in, a, in an interpretive sense is that you ask the question, well, so we accept the fact that atoms behave in a strange way. Um, and, and also the theory does tell you how classical behaviour, so the behaviour of cups and things and people, how that emerges from the theory. But you still have this problem that when you try to interpret it as a theory of big things, then it's you get these Schrodinger's cat type problems where things are indeed everything that can happen is happening cats can be alive and dead people can be in an infinite number of places at once and and so it's how you interpret that I think that the problem really is it's a probabilistic theory so it's telling you about the the probability that things will happen and if you think about it how do you interpret that what does it mean to say well there's a 50 percent chance it's going to be here well you might say well no but it, it is there isn't it uh, well, no, it isn't. There's a 50% chance it's going to be there. That's, that's how the theory works. Yeah, I must say um, I found the entanglement, so, which you deal with in that book, of something splitting and being here and there, and here could be, uh, I don't know, light years away from there, mm. and yet there are, in some ways, they are still unified. Yeah, well, actually, it's very interesting, actually, because in... In the book, we do what's called non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And then it's absolutely true. If you say, if I put a particle at a point, so technically there, I know exactly where it is. Where is it at the next instant? The answer is anywhere in the universe with equal probability. So there's no regard for, for relativity at all in this, in this theory. It just... It, it seems odd because relativity tells us that influences can't travel faster than the speed of light. So there should be some restriction. Now, in quantum field theory, which is the relativistic version of this, the, there is a, a modification, a quite severe modification to that. But still, there's an apparent violation of the spirit of Einstein's theory of relativity. Things instantaneously seem to shift. One example of this is something called the EPR paradox, which bothered Einstein a lot. And um, actually, a physicist, um, so, so we'd said this in the book, and I also said this in some interviews, and a physicist called Sean Carroll, who's an excellent physicist in, over um, on the west coast of America, I think he's at Stanford, I think, um, he, he questioned this. He said, no, I, I don't believe that. I think you're misrepresenting the theory, because I, I think that it surely is the case that relativity is respected. So we thought, OK, um, we'll, we'll prove it. We, we, we think that the book's right. In, 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 it's technically right, but, but in spirit, is it right? And uh, we couldn't prove it. So uh, my friend Jeff Forshaw, who's a theoretical physicist, couldn't do the integrals. It's a technical problem. And so, so we thought, OK, so um, someone must have proved this. The, the, you know, maybe we were wrong, but someone. And, and we look back, and, and Feynman had actually done some work on this in the early days, and he couldn't do it either, because you can't do the integrals. They're too well, hard. Well, Feynman can't do it. So, so <laughs> well, But now, so it, it actually turns out to be a very interesting problem. Um, so I don't know, actually, at the moment. What, what I'm doing is I, we've started a research project, which is the interesting thing, based on this popular book. And, and, and I'm writing code at the moment because we, we, I think you can do these integrals now with computers. Yeah. But back in the, the old foundational days in the 60s and 70s, you know, this was kind of 
we, everyone's fairly sure that everything works out, but no one's actually shown mm. precisely how it works out. So it's actually quite an interesting problem. So it may be that that statement, everything that can happen does happen. It may be that in relativistic quantum field theory, it needs a, it, it, it should be watered down somewhat. Um, but actually, I don't know at the moment. So it's a very interesting. Yeah. But I think it's an interesting example of how you teach yeah. or you you simplify something for a book and you say something which is which is technically correct as far as you can tell. But there's a lot of nuance in there actually, sure. <laughs> which we're still investigating. So you said popular positive. book. There's lots of nuance, but there also there are several equations, and that's probably the most technical of your books. How did it yeah. go with the public? Well, it's done very well. It actually, the response tends to be split. If you look on Amazon, for example, or you look at the comments on some book site, then there are people that love it because it does explain the theory and it does derive things. And indeed, at the end, we derive something called the Chandrasekhar limit, which is effectively, well, it's the maximum mass of a white dwarf star. What it really is, is the, the, the maximum mass of a, a blob of matter that can be held up by quantum effects, basically. You find out it's 1.4 times the mass of the sun which is indeed correct. It's one of the great calculations in physics. So we calculate that. And so if people pay attention to the book and really want to understand the theory, then then the, the feedback is that they do. And they, they feel wonderful and they give it five stars. But there's another set of people that, that want a, a more popular book and they really would just like a descriptive uh, book. But I think there are a lot of descriptive books about quantum mechanics. So that's not what we set out to do. We set out to write a book that actually explain the theory in as, as deeply as we could but to, with no mathematics that's harder than school maths sure, so that's the sure. point so if, you, if you're comfortable doing things like pythagoras and stuff yeah. then our view as, as authors is that you can follow the book if you want to and some bits might be hard and you might have to think but then you know it's so it's a different book yeah it, yeah that's the most impressive hope. thing is that it, it's difficult enough and yet the public responds to that sort of thing. But what I want to ask you now is something that I actually saw at the time the Higgs boson seemed to be confirmed. And this was a remarkable announcement coming from two teams. And I saw you say in public that this was the most important, significant discovery of your lifetime. Yeah. Why, why so? Well, it's the... the for the first thing to say is the, this theory, it's called the standard model of particle physics, um, is, is a, it's a quantum theory and it's a, a description of three of the four forces of nature. So other than gravity, it describes at a fundamental level everything we know about the way the universe works at the basic level. So it's electricity and magnetism, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force. And it contains this thing called the Higgs mechanism. It's a unique mechanism in physics. It, it essentially says that less than a billionth of a second after the Big Bang that something condensed out, if you like, in, into the vacuum. So that the technical word for this Higgs field is it's a condensate. So you can imagine almost it, it's similar physics to water condensing out onto a, a pane of glass. So a cold pane of glass and you see liquid water appear on it. So the water vapour changes state, it becomes liquid. It's very similar to that, actually, in some ways. It's a radical suggestion. And then the suggestion is that things get mass by interacting with this condensate, almost, if you like, bouncing off Higgs particles. It's slightly looser language, but essentially zigzagging through this stuff. And that's how things get mass. So it's a very odd theory. And actually, more than that, if you calculate naively the energy wrapped up in this Higgs field in every cubic metre of space, you find out that it's greater than the solar energy output in a thousand years. So more energy in the sun outputs in a thousand years per cubic metre. It's very odd theory. It actually turns out that that's correct. And, and what I think is very... So that's odd in itself. We found, we found that, that that's a true description of nature. What I think is even more interesting is it was, it was in there that that proposal was made for mathematical reasons by Peter Higgs and others back in the 1960s. So it was almost, I think, an observation that, that this is a, a cool almost a trick maybe that's devaluing it slightly but it's almost like a cool trick to we can give masses to things preserve the beauty or the symmetry if you like of these equations if we are allowed to this rather strange mechanism so so i think that it's one of the great demonstrations of the power of mathematics in physics in theoretical physics predicting something that's real so this is not esoteric this is absolutely the reason why the fundamental particles get their mass so why why an electron has mass or why the w and z particles that carry the weak force have mass we, we now know that's correct we don't know yet which higgs particle 
it is. I mean, th- technically, if you've been absolutely precise, we don't actually know it. we've discovered the Higgs particle. <laughs> what we've discovered is... It still a, goes on. It's a boson, definitely. A boson And it is a boson about 120, what, six times the mass of the proton, give or take. So, so it's, it's a boson with the right mass and some of the right properties to be a Higgs. But actually, the challenge now in, 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 at CERN is to measure how this thing decays does it it, we've seen it decaying to two photons for example which is how we know it's a boson but we want to see it decaying to electrons or tau all the different um, different things it can decay into and see if that matches the predictions of the basic Higgs theory the so-called standard model or is it a different one there are theories where there are five Higgs is for example so could it be one of a number of Higgs particles we don't know that yet and will they find that out in the near future because they're closing down CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, for a refit. Yeah, basically it's, it, these maintenance shutdowns are very difficult to do on the LHC because it's cold, so it runs at minus 271 degrees or so, very close to absolute zero. So it takes a month or so to warm the thing up and a month to cool it down. And obviously the things, it, it you know, you can have problems when you warm things up and cool things down. So you try to not do maintenance on the machine. Mm. Uh, so you have long maintenance things. So it's a planned maintenance, which has already been pushed back because it's running so well. I mean, it's running beyond anybody's expectations, which is a tremendous achievement for this thing. But you must remember it's the most complicated machine by some measure that we've ever built in history. And, and the fact that it works better than expected and has already made this discovery, which is really one of the key reasons that the machine was built, I think is remarkable. It certainly is. Now, I want to ask you about an infinite monkey cage, which is coming yeah. up on the radio, Radio National, at uh, the end of December. Mm. You've been there more or less since the beginning. What What is the Infinite Monkey Cage? Well, it was an idea on, on BBC Radio that, that we had to, to have. A, it's basically a science chat show. But um, th- there's a, a sort of a, a history in Britain, uh, which is growing now, to, to mix science and comedy. And I think it, it sounds like an odd thing to do. It's really, I think, personality driven. It's the fact that there are a lot of comedians in Britain who have an interest in science. Um, Dara O'Brien, for example, who I, who I co-present programmes with, has a degree in, in physics from Dublin. Um, Robin Ince, who I co-present Monkey Cage with, is is an avid reader of science. He, he knows if you ask him what date did Richard Feynman say this, then he'll know. Right. So, so it was the, the idea was to to have a a, a relatively light hearted but often deep as well discussion about particular scientific issues so so usually it's a panel show we we usually have two scientists and one comedian guest and then there's myself and robin and we just talk and actually we record it in front of a live audience and usually it goes on for about two hours and then the poor editor has to sit there and edit it down to 30 minutes so what you hear is a snapshot of this rambling formless discussion around you know, uh, it, we, we did one called, for example, provocatively called Is Cosmology a Science, for example, where we're talking about cosmology and the data. And so we, so, so that, that's basically the format. And how do you respond? Because you're not a stand-up comedian. I mean, your background in music, if anything, yeah. in the public sense. Uh, do you feel obliged to keep saying jokes? No, it's not my job. I mean, that's the, and we, we always tell the scientists this, the, the scientist's job. So my job and the scientist's job is to, is to talk about the science. And then Robin's job and the, the, the comedian's job is to, is to respond. But actually, you find that often it, it isn't supposed to be funny. It can be funny. But often you find that the comedian guest will have some interest and will end up interviewing the scientist. So it's we have no structure in the programme. It's just everybody sits there and talks about whatever they like to talk about. An example, just recently we had uh, Patrick Stewart, uh, the John Captain Picard from Star Trek, came on to talk about man's space flight. So he wasn't being a comedian, although he was quite funny, actually, because he started talking about his experiences when exploring planets. And things, you know, so but so, so, and he was talking to the, the Monica Grady, who's one of the, the a professor at the Open University who's been very heavily involved in, in robotic space exploration. And so the, he ended, ended up interviewing her and we, myself and Robin, didn't really do anything. And that's and, the point. As we both know, that that's the way that real scientists actually talk because they're not being po-faced and stiff and formal all the time. Yeah. And, talking in Martian, what they do do is joke about their ideas. So it's not yes. in any way reducing the the ideas or the moral impact oh. or the... the, the, the Dumbing down, in other words. You've hit on an interesting question, actually, because um, 
when you popularize science, as you know, then there will be people who say, well, it's too important to be treated in that way. Actually, I think it's the reverse. Science is too important not to be part of popular culture. It is, as Carl Sagan always emphasized, it is absolutely the foundation of our society. We live in scientific societies. So to have a society where, where science is somehow divorced from the rest of culture, it seems to me to be... Uh, well, I mean, Sagan, again, emphasize it's almost anti-democratic. It is anti-democratic because you have people who live in democracies whose lives are controlled by scientific decisions. If they know nothing about the science, then there's a democratic deficit. And you have problems because society can make decisions that are not based on reason. And One not thinks based of on the anything. last American election. I mean, <laughs> science was well, almost invisible. Yeah, yeah, although Obama did make a very clear statement about climate change in his victory speech, which I thought was very... At the, end. Yeah. Um, at, the, yeah. at the end, but yeah. it does, it shows you, and, and that, that's an example, that, that's because you have a society where there are many people who are not, don't understand that science is not a belief system and it's not a point of view, that the scientists are not an interest group. I mean, they, you know, politically, maybe they can be when they're lobbying for funding, but in, in, essentially science is a process, it's actually the process by which we understand how nature works. So if you want to ask a question about is it true that putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere heats the climate, there is only one way to find out. It's to t- get data, build models and try and understand the data. There is no other way. You can't sit there and say, well, I'd rather it wasn't because that would be unfortunate, have tax implications. That's, that's contentless. So I think that's the point about... I really I feel quite strongly that the the science it jostles for position. Right? We we live you know we work in the media as well as as being scientists, and you've, so you've got reality TV shows and Dancing with the Stars or whatever. And science has to compete in that arena for for attention, and and to particularly amongst children as well. You you got to you got to inspire them. They're also inspired by pop music and they're inspired by sports. They need to be inspired by science. Sure. So I think it's important. We talk about public response. I know that there are several groups who've taken science on the road. Uh, member of my family, Ben Goldacre, with uh, yeah. Simon uh, yeah, and Singh, and, Robin, yeah. and, yeah. and yourself. Uh, and you feel stadia, like you know, the old yeah. days of, of, of rock stars, feeling yeah. rock stadia. How do you account for the fact that science is so popular in the public area in Britain? these days well, like that there's there's a widespread acceptance of what i just said that i think the scientific community now supports this idea that science has to be part of culture so you, a lot of scientists will engage and what we do with, with ben and simon and myself and robin is we, we provide it's almost like a variety show so these live shows are not just us they're local scientists come on as well but you're right they're three and a half thousand seater four thousand seater auditorium we actually did glastonbury and eight thousand people came 8, to a 000. recording of the monkey cage it's a radio program with 8,000 people but and, and Ben said to me actually Ben Goldacre he, he was actually talking about um, uh, publication bias in drug uh, trials right which is not the sort of rock and roll thing to do but he, he got so the audience and him got so excited that it was almost like you know Aerosmith or something. It was like a rock star <laughs> going, and you know what? You see, there's a bias here. Only positive trials are published and negative trials are suppressed. And they're like, yeah! you know. They, yeah. So, so there's an atmosphere. And I think what it is, really, I think, is people respond to ideas. And what, what we're really doing is, 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 is giving a, a, a snapshot of, of ideas to the audience. And because we make it move fast, so it's not a, an hour-long lecture, it's people giving 10-minute slots of snapshots of uh, it can be publication bias it can be cosmology it can be whatever and then there's some comedians there as well science-based comedy and so that's what i think people respond to because it's stimulating so i'm yeah. not surprised i know that people are interested in science if i go to a, a pub now because i'm on tv in britain then i get asked a lot of questions about black holes and cosmology and particle physics because people are naturally interested yeah. so i think i think it's not surprising actually indeed now when it comes to uh, your own filming, you've had several series, uh, mainly, as, as one would imagine, the astrophysics, looking at the sky, the ones of the solar system and uh, of the universe. But now you've turned to life. Mm. And the latest book and the latest series, packed full of all the ideas in biology and zoology and, and, and evolution. How did you come up? How did you manage to digest all that stuff? Well, I mean, the idea initially came... There's, there's a very famous book called What is Life by Owen Schrodinger, 
father of quantum mechanics. He, it's some, based on some lectures he gave in Dublin in 1943. And, and the thesis of the book, he asks it right on page one, it's, it's how do the laws of physics and chemistry account for the events in space and time inside a living organism, he says, which is essentially he's saying, you know, how can the laws of physics and chemistry explain life? And he goes on to address two things, really. One is he essentially predicted the existence of DNA. He calls it an aperiodic crystal, so a molecule that can carry information from generation to generation. But also he looks at the thermodynamics of life. And this, to me, was even more interesting. It's the, it's the challenge to physics to say, given the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the universe tends to disorder, so we, we know this, that this is the, the way things are. If you leave things, they get more disordered. How is it that these ordered structures form? The, the human brain being the most ordered structure we know of in the universe. How did that form spontaneously from a collapsing cloud of dust 4.8 billion years ago or so? And so those questions I get asked a lot. So from my previous series, Wonders of the Universe, we dealt with entropy in terms of the heat death of the universe and everything falling to bits. And, and it's natural for people to say, well, what about life? Life runs counter to that. So, and Schrodinger speaks to that, and now we understand quite well. It's called non-equilibrium thermodynamics. But I thought calling a series that was from an introduction to non-equilibrium <laughs> thermodynamics. So, so, so it's basically the idea that, that a physicist can can attack these questions, profound questions, from the point of view of a physicist. But then, of course, from a televisual perspective, you've got natural history, and you've got you can use animals to tell these stories. I mean, for example, the the order, the the, the entry point for order in the in the biosphere is essentially photosynthesis. So essentially, what's happening is that you're getting ordered energy from the sun, and disordered energy as heat is being re-radiated back into space. And there's a almost an order gap. Life essentially borrows some order for a while. Um, and so, so we, we, went, we filmed in a lake in Palau, which is full of jellyfish who have photosynthetic algae inside them. And so that they actually essentially are an animal that, that lives as close as you can to photosynthesis. So the, 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 the symbiotic algae take the light from the sun and they use the, that as food for the, for the jellyfish. So, so you can tell the story of how photosynthesis essentially begins to build order by CO2 and water and make sugar. Well, that's an ordered molecule from two less ordered things because you've got this ordered light from the sun. And so, so you can... It's a new way, in, in a way, of looking at natural history. Taking the history, starting point of physics, yes. That's yeah. very interesting because uh, Schrodinger's lecture was reenacted just last July in Dublin. You know, uh, as yes. part of their festival, which was yeah. uh, quite marvellous. And there's another section of the, the, the film which I found absolutely lovely, which reminded me of Javius Haldane writing mm. about uh, being the right size. Yeah. And if you sort of drop a mouse, it gets up and runs away, and a cat, you know, shrugs itself... And a, a horse splashes. Yeah, I mean that yeah. phrase is just yes. so. And, and of course, that's physics. It's, it's what you did. Physics. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about. I mean, because naively you'd look, and we we actually the, the film that we address that with is a film about size, and we filmed the whole thing in Australia. Actually, primarily because there were several interesting animals we could use. The great white sharks off the South Neptune Islands, which uh, that their shape is is driven by the the hydrodynamics of water. Basically, that's why they're the shape that they are. And also, we filmed uh, coconut crabs or rubber crabs on Christmas Island. It's these enormous crabs. Uh, it's uh, a and, fabulous picture of you standing next to a yeah. tree with one up. I mean, it's just bigger than you are. <laughs> it, it's a huge thing, and they live for seventy years. One of the great questions in biology is why, in general, do big things live? longer than small things. It's, there's actually some debate about why that is. It's not a settled question in biology. That's actually the thing about biology. You find it as a physicist, you come to it and it's, it's fascinating, but quite frustrating because there are no rules in biology. There are, there are sort of guidelines, but there are exceptions to everything you say. Then life has found some way of creating an exception to that statement. So it's rather more difficult, actually, to make a program about. But I found it a fascinating sort of 18 months or two years of, of, of learning about evolutionary biology. And the thing that shocked me most or surprised me most was that the rapid progress in biology that's been made since I last did it academically, which is really back in the late 80s, um, particularly based on DNA sequencing and that technology, the fact it's cheap now. So the precision with which we know when, you know, if you trace back, you look at common ancestors between different species and the precision with which we're beginning to map that tree of life, the evolutionary history of life, took me by surprise, actually. And it's relatively modern science. Oh, yeah. Biology is doing fantastic things at the mm. moment. 
Um, and the final question, really, about your experience of, of making that film, because a friend, a mutual friend of ours, mm. suggested I ask you how much your attitude to filming has changed in the years since you first started to now. Pro I was probably more belligerent um, when we started, um, because the the processes of television are very irritating i, I found I'll you know the, that. Yes. And, and, and so so uh, what what i've learned as well as th this wonderful opportunity to learn about science beyond the physics that i do I, i've learned a little bit about how to construct films how films are constructed and so i think we've been making better films my, my, i work with the same team at the bbc all the time and i think we've been making better films because i am beginning to get an understanding of what it takes to make a film as well so in a sense it's, it's become easier and and also of course more natural i mean what, what because the, i think the skill of talking on camera is that it's a skill that's learned it's like playing the piano or, that's right so there's, so there's very few people i think are, are naturally able to just be be eloquent when looking at so a camera what would your reason. advice be to professors who are continually asked to turn up to do something that takes three hours and which might result in 35 seconds <laughs> you know they're really angry and they keep saying no what would your advice to them be i, I think it's a skill worth learning because it is so important that the science that we do is out there and understood. I mean, you know, you can make the argument that you're not going to teach anyone about quantum theory in an hour's program about quantum theory or an interview. Of course, you're not. But you, you're going to give people a flavor which may stimulate their interest and they'll go and find out some more. But more than that, it's, it's making the science, it's making it obviously and self-evidently relevant it, it obvious it, to us as academics it is obviously the basis of our civilization it should go without saying but that's actually been the mistake it, the, the the experience in britain um with, with convincing government to fund research has been that gov government don't necessarily know because they've got lots of pressures from lots of industry groups they don't actually know it's not self-evident to them that, that funding scientific research and education is the basis to a more prosperous future it is the foundation of our society it's not actually self-evident to them so so as academics i think we have a, a duty and, and and an intense self self-interest actually in learning how to deal with the media and and you have to learn it it's, it's very annoying and very frustrating you get asked silly questions and you get asked them over and over again and and you know th there are things you have to notice i mean I, I get frustrated with television people because sometimes they want you to say something which is not right and you'll find and often this is a tip to, to professors who often if someone keeps saying something and you think it's ridiculous it's because they've got a very profound misconception about the science and so it's good to pick that up you should never say something that's wrong in order to get out of the room <laughs> right but but it is worth sometimes saying to them why are you asking that what do you think and you'll often find that they've got something wrong and then you can and that's what i meant by learning and, and being less belligerent instead of just saying look you are an idiot i'm just going to keep saying this i've learned sometimes these, these people want to make good programs as well so sometimes it's worth teasing out where the the misconception is so you can make a better program together that's what i'd say about it thank you very much brian it's a pleasure rn your world unfolding <laughs>